Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Photography Schoolhouse. I'm Kerry Allen, and I'm going to be your presenter for this broadcast of Get Your First 100 or Next 100 Photography Clients. Now, this presentation is aimed more at the portrait photography studio, more so than uh, commercial photography or fashion. Um, we're talking about families, portraits, um, babies, boudoir, that sort of photo that end of photography and as an industry we've had some challenges in running our businesses so we're going to address one of the biggest problems of all and that's getting new clients in the door so every client every every sorry every business needs to constantly attract new customers this is an ongoing process it never really stops um, and attracting new customers by putting in um, or putting on specials or things like that really doesn't do the job. Uh, we need a better strategy for coming up with ways of getting new, fresh blood in the door. Even if you're an established photo studio, you know that you, you're going to lose customers every year. People move away, or they change, they go to a competitor, whatever. Um, so just because you have a stable of viewers doesn't mean you're always going to have them. So, or so sorry, I was distracted by a question. Uh, so just doing this as a... Um, marketing strategy that you can execute pretty much at will and bring a constant stream of uh, fresh blood in the door. You know, in the old days, and I've been around for a long time, I've, I'm in my 60s now, I've had a studio since I was 14, or I've been in the photography business, didn't always have a studio. Um, so I've come through a lot of generations of this business. And believe me, in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot easier um, a lot easier. Marketing wasn't a big deal. Um, I know myself and plenty of photographers that just open up a studio and magically business just came in the door. You don't even really know where it came from. Um, so, you know, you maybe had a Yellow Pages ad. That was about the extent of your marketing. Um, all of those things, any marketing strategy, if it's more than about five years old, it's going to fail. So things that don't work anymore, newspaper, forget it, radio, TV, gun. Um, a lot of advocates talk about putting up in-store displays. It's very, very minimal, the return on this now. Email campaigns, which have been big. I, I made uh, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of money and a lot of, uh, got a lot of customers through email because I adopted early. But now I read a stat the other day that the average user gets 168 emails a day. They're saturated. And I know myself, when I open up my email box, the top 10 or 20 messages are all just junk, spam things, and I delete them um, unopened without even looking at it. So email has become more of a minimalized thing than it has in the past, even though there's a lot of companies out there I want to tell you differently it's usually the only ones telling you that are the ones that are trying to sell you something um, passive blog posting well blog posting I call it passive it has a minimal direct response but what I believe is it has an awesome SEO benefit and we're gonna get more into that a little bit later if you've ever used or thinking about using Google AdWords again um, Google has changed a lot. The competition is fierce. Um, one of the things that they've changed that really bothers me is when you do a search, any search on Google right now, the first four responses are all sponsored links. Used to be that there were none, then there was one or two. Now it's up to four. The f so out of the top 10 spots, four of them are taken up by paid advertising. So in my opinion, it was tough enough to get into the top 10 anyways, which means that it's 
even tougher. It's really the top six now, unless um, you're going to pay big time dollars, I guess. <clears throat> so what does work? You have to think about the motivation of what causes people to spend money. Why, why do they choose to go to a particular place? And usually it's because they have some sort of confidence with their decision. They, they've chosen that vendor for a reason that they're comfortable with. Could be that they know them personally, or they've been doing business there for years and they know the results. They, they know what they're going to get. Uh, or they've had a referral from a friend that says, no, I went to Joe Blow and it was great. It was awesome. The work was fantastic. If they have that time. If anything, any one of those things that gets them the confidence they need to spend their money. And that's what we really need to do today is we need to become one of those people, one of those people that they're confident with. So my bullet points is making friends, shaking hand, and running for president. My whole point there is more personal contact with your potential clients. We've always had personal contacts with our existing clients. That's obvious. They came for pictures. We know them. They already know what to expect. They either come back or they don't. Um, but potential clients are who we really want to build uh, confidence with. So how do we build this credibility? Awesome website samples. They can go to our website and take a look. Uh, blog posts that display your knowledge, interacting with them on social media, all of these things, they get to know you. Even though they haven't maybe seen you face to face, and they know that, geez, when it comes to uh, this kind of photo baby photography, newborn photography, that's the person that knows what to do. Have you just seen their website? It's fantastic. So those are kind of our strategies of what we're doing differently today than what we were more than five years ago. More than five years ago, marketing was almost always about running a special. You took out a newspaper ad and you ran, you know, newborn photography from $49 or whatever you were doing. Advertising like that today doesn't work like it used to. I still do it. I still do it, but I do it sparingly. I put a lot more effort into other things. So what is the plan? We need to become a guru in our chosen field, and we need to become this friend of potential clients. Um, we do this one way, and, and this, the picture on the side of the slide right now is actually from my website. This is a blog post I did. Fall is great for family portraits, 10 tips on how to get great shots yourself using your smartphone. Almost sounds like reverse selling. I'm a photo studio. I want them to come to me for pictures, but here's I'm telling them how they can do it themselves. And there's some strategy here because people don't want to know how to spend money. People are more interested in how not to spend money. So putting up this blog post and then getting this message out to people helps um, identify that I know what I'm talking about. So it builds my guru status and it doesn't show me as a used car salesman. It shows me as just somebody that knows what they're doing and isn't afraid to, uh, to say these things. You don't look like a con man uh, with free advice. So it's very careful how you approach this. It's not about making teasers to entice people to buy. It's about giving them so much value and so much valuable information that it feels like they're trying to sip from a fire hose. So in other words, the 10 points. If I could click the Read More button, which I can't because that's just a slide in PowerPoint, um, it would go on in great detail about each one of those 10 points. And that's what I say. Give them a lot of genuine information. Don't skimp. Don't say, you know, follow my 10-point plan. It's been $49.95 and just, you know, follow my plan. Don't do that. You're not trying to sell educational products. You're trying to sell photography. So 
if you followed me on Photography Schoolhouse over the years, you know that my favorite thing to do is not talk BS. Uh, so I normally give um, real life examples, something that I have done that I can measure. Um, this started way back almost 10 years ago when I was going to trade shows, wedding shows and advertising as a wedding photographer. I did a long series of posts about the experience, pictures of customers standing in our booth, uh, pictures of how crowded the aisles were, pictures of what food was available. I took a lot of pictures and I detailed every expense right to the penny pretty much. Um, and people loved it because it was real. It wasn't me saying, okay, you know, follow my 10 point trade show success program. Um, this was real information and people reacted to it very positively. So we have always trying to do that in photography schoolhouse. So if I'm going to put together a program that says, get your first 100 or your next 100 photography clients, I better be doing something pretty serious beforehand. So a year ago, I decided to take it on myself to do exactly that, that we were going to build a brand new studio business, photography business, from nothing in an area that didn't know me from a hole in the ground and build it up and see if I could get a hundred new clients in the first year, if I could start a revenue stream from this business starting from a cold uh, start. So that's what we did. Now, most of you know me, um, my main photography business for a long time, decades now, has been in Scottsdale, Arizona. I also travel to Canada from time to time. Um, I picked a location in Canada, um, in a place called Sudbury, where they didn't know me. They didn't know I was a photographer. Um, I took out an apartment. I spent time in Sudbury, and I started a business from scratch. And I, I promised two things. Number one, that we would start a revenue stream within three months and that we would get over 100 new clients in the first year. Now, I, took, I kept a log book on this. So Photography Schoolhouse Gold members, if you're a gold member, and I know many of you are, uh, you have access to that log book I kept. You can see day by day, step by step, step exact, exactly what happened the actual numbers were the actual counts. No BS, no fabrication, no exaggeration, nothing. That's the facts. Sorry, I thought I skipped a slide. So I also worried about limitations. I have a number of limitations. I've been doing this. I mentioned I was over 60. If you know me from other presentations where you've seen me, you know that I'm a big guy. Bald, just not all the desirable things you want in life. Old, fat, and bald. Um, I'm starting a new business at the age of 60. How would customers perceive me? Are they only looking for young, trendy photographers? Being a big guy, a lot of people, they're not very happy with that. It's a turnoff for a lot of people. I deal with that. It's my personal problem, so no big deal. And I was starting a boudoir business. That was the section I decided to tackle. I didn't want weddings. I've shot enough weddings to last 10 lifetimes. I was done with weddings. Um, so I wanted to start a boudoir business, and I wanted to do um, headshots. Do families, too. So those were kind of my three market segments, but it occurred to me, you know, when you get to be 60, you know a few things, or you discover a few things, even if they're by accident. And I thought to myself, what is going to be the easiest way to make fast progress? And that was with the boudoir, because um, we're playing off people's vanity. Now, everybody wants a family portrait, too, but, you know, that's not a hot button that much. It's it's kind of a way down the less hot button. Everybody needs a headshot for business, maybe, so, you know, there's some leverage there.
But you could talk to most women about a boudoir session and somewhere in their life they've thought about it. And they're probably a little bit embarrassed. They think that they're too old or they're too big or need to lose weight or, you know, they're whatever. They've got limitations they worry about just like I do. Um, so I'm a man in a boudoir field when most women are boudoir photographers now. Uh, how would they perceive that? Um, I don't have a studio. I'm going to have to shoot in my apartment that I took out. I'm not going to commit money to a commercial studio until I have a proven track record. So there's no way I'm just going to spend a whack of cash and rent some retail space and decorate it and so on. Just not going to do it. Um, don't ever do that. I don't think you do that for any business unless maybe it's a franchise and they have a proven success formula. You don't know if you're going to succeed or not, just like I didn't know if I was going to succeed. I was worried about the state of photography. Is professional photography a dying business? We hear rumors like this all the time. We all know photographers that have closed up and moved on. I saw a post from a friend of mine in Las Vegas just today who was, and he had a gorgeous studio. I, I drooled with envy when I visited his studio. Um, and he's, he's throwing in the towel just today. He said, that's it. I'm done with this market. Um, it is tough. So is it a dying business? I don't think so. But it sure is a change business. And we have to react to that. So also, this particular area, the Sudbury area that I talk about, has high unemployment and middle to lower incomes. Not really all that bad, to be honest. There are much worse communities. Um, but this community was targeted in all of Canada. Um, this was the one where it is toughest to get a job in the entire country. This is ground zero of toughness. Um, so got a lot of factors against me. So I'm thinking to myself, why am I not just hanging it up and retiring and say, well, that was a good run, but I'm, I'm ready to move on to more fun. Well, uh, what do you do? I just did it. I just did it. Never mind that I'm fat, old, and bald. Never mind that it's a bad economy. Never mind that it's everybody's saying it's a dying industry. Never mind, never mind, never mind. I just did it. And it worked. And I'm going to tell you how. But first, before we get into nitty-gritty details, and I am, don't worry, I'm not, uh, this isn't a bait-and-switch kind of program. Um, I want to set some thoughts in your mind and some ground rules for how we're going to make this possible. And first of all is to see if you've got the internal fortitude to do something like this, because it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would have done it by now. This is going to be a something to really tackle. So is it something you really want to do? Do you want to be a photographer? Then do it. Is this something you can deliver quality product in? And you can't judge your own product. Everybody thinks their stuff is awesome. And most of it, honestly, is crap. I produced crap. And I produced some good stuff. And it's a constant struggle to try and get the good stuff. Um, but you have to show your work to others. And not just a friend say, hey, what do you think of that? Because they're going to people please. They're going to just turn around and say, hey, that's awesome. What an awesome picture, when really it's just crap. You've got to get some serious um, adjudication done on your work before you can answer bullet point number two. Submit some pictures to some professional contests. If you're uh, a member of PPA, Photogra uh, Professional Photographers of America, they usually have state chapters. Uh, enter, join, and enter in their competitions. Get honest critique and feedback. Do not try and judge your own work. You will get it wrong every time. Um, are you a dedicated kind of a individual? And here you just have to do some self-analysis. 
do you jump from thing to thing to thing? It's kind of the flavor of the day kind of guy. If you're that, if you're not not able to dedicate yourself and to stick with this, um, then don't do it. Or the opposite, if you can dedicate yourself and you can stick to it day after day, week after week, month after month, then do it. But don't expect photography to come to the rescue for a financial problem. It's not going to happen. Do you have a way of carrying yourself financially during the first year? Maybe even the first two years. Will it produce an in, uh, some revenue? Absolutely it will. Will it be enough to live off? Honestly, it's unlikely. It's not going to be that fast to become a full-time, <clears throat> excuse me, full-time family supporting income. It'll happen in time, but maybe not today. So you got to think about those points and you have to do some careful analysis. And here's really how to screw it all up. If you are going to worry and get distressed over slow business times. Just because business is slow this month doesn't mean your business is dead. It means it's a slow month. But if you get all depressed and say, that's it, I'm failing, I'm throwing in the towel. Well, that's it. You're just, you know, you can't do that. You have to be in for the long haul. So again, this is self-analysis of your own personality. Do you get easily turned off or do you have the ability to ride it out? And again, if you think this will quickly replace a lost income from another source, don't do it. I have heard time and time again, uh, people tell me that, oh, I've lost my job or my I lost my job and then four months later, my husband lost their job or their wife, whatever. And so we're really hoping to make photography, you know, replace our lost income. It's going to lead to disaster. You're just walking the plank. Um, that's, that's not a reason to get into this business. If you don't have sufficient time, you know, there's a lot of mums in this business. And honestly, if you've got young children, <clears throat> I understand how hard that is and what you have to overcome to be able to um, dedicate yourself, your energy, and your time to maintaining a business, uh, particularly if you've got young kids. Well, young kids, let's say, under the age of 35. Um and if you don't aspire to be the best photographic or the best photographic artist or the best photographer, don't do it. Because I'll tell you right now in this market, only the best survive. Well, there was a time, and I, I took marketing courses back and you know, many, many times actually over the decades that I've been a photographer, and usually it would always boil down to make a decision of where you want to be in the marketplace. Be a low-volume, high-priced deluxe studio or be a high-volume, low-priced studio. Your choice. Um, I thought at, in the beginning of my career that I'd be a high-volume, low-priced studio and eventually work my way up to low-volume, high-price. And back then, the strategy kind of worked out. Um, I don't honestly believe you can do it that well today. Now, the middle ground, be somewhere in the middle, um, bad choice today. That used to be a plan. It's dead. Don't even think it. Wipe it out of your brain. The deal is the middle turf is gone. It's wiped out, the middle ground. There are now two areas of photography that are surviving. The low road, which has long-term failure written all over it, and the high road, which also has potential failure. So the low road will kill your business, your mind, your soul. And most of those photographers, if they stay in it long enough, will go bankrupt. Fortunately, most get out in the nick of time and go get a job so they don't have to go bankrupt. It will grind you to nothing. So the only thing, in my opinion, that's left today is the high road. So we're going to do that. 
we're going to be the best photographers we can be. So if you don't have that dedication that we talked about, then don't do it. You've got to dedicate yourself to being the best photographer, the ultimate high end. That's where we're going. So also let's look at the overall strategy. <clears throat> Start by attracting clients with low price or even free sessions, which is sounds like what I just said not to do, but wait, bear with me a second. Do an awesome job. Defy their expectations to deliver a product they never thought they could get um, at the price that they're paying. Customer service them to death. Make them the happiest that they ever have been for dealing with you as your photog as their photographer. Um, now, just doing that alone, most will upgrade and pay for extra photographs. The vast majority of them will do that. Sometimes not a lot, sometimes really nice, and sometimes surprisingly nice. Some won't. Some will just blow off anything. They won't spend a dime. They'll take whatever your special or freebie was and just don't worry about it. That's going to happen. Screw it. Toss it off. doesn't matter. What you do want to do, though, is get model releases from every session without exception and then use the very best of those shoots as sample images for your website, your social media, sample albums, sample prints in the studio, whatever. Then what we're going to do is reach out to their network of contacts and friends. Now, people will share. When they have a good experience, sure, they'll tell some friends, but we're going to help that along. We're not going to just take a passive approach here, which we could have done in the 80s or 90s. Um, we can't do that. We can only take an active approach. So we're going to reach out to those friends um, and show them what a great job we did. So building your clientele, in, in this presentation, I'm going to refer to it as your herd. Building that is paramount. And... We want to keep in regular contact with them, and we want to get them back in the door. Not all of them. Those ones that took the freebie and took off, screw them. We're not worried about them. We're taking the ones that spent the extra money, and we're going to make them part of our herd, and we're going to get them back in the door, and we're going to keep in touch with them um, a lot. So that sounds easy. The catch is you might get stuck with the wrong kind of clients on a recurring basis. And that's the thing that we want to avoid. That's the low price, high volume studio I said would kill you. So we don't want to fall into that trap. We've started down that road, but we don't want to stay there. It's really imperative that we take step by step to switch that around. But you can't start, in my opinion, and maybe somebody's done it, but I haven't seen it in any of my experiences, and I talk to a lot of photographers through Photography Schoolhouse, um, to just declare yourself a high-end photographer and be high-priced and start from nothing. Man, that's a tough road. In my opinion, it's so much easier to get a herd together and then selectively work with the ones that you really want. Now, the other strat part of this strategy is don't just start with low prices and plan on increasing, you know, six months, I'll add some and one year and two years and so on. Um, right from the beginning, present yourself as a high price studio. They just happened to catch you while you were holding this awesome promotion. So they don't think they're buying a cheap portrait. They think they're buying a really expensive portrait for a super discounted price. So they they know not to expect that time after time. If you charged, and I know one guy was charging $8 for an 8x10, which I can't believe, and hopefully none of you listening are doing that. But uh, he was charging $8. So if you go to his studio, and he's out of business. He closed up. He didn't even make it a year. Um 
But imagine the mentality of the customer if they bought eight by tens from them at eight dollars a couple of weeks ago and they go back now and they're twenty one dollars. You know, that's a much, much harder road to go down than just presenting it. Oh, I'm getting a eighty dollar eight by ten, but I'm only paying twenty five bucks for it. Um, then they know the next time they come in, it's going to be 80 bucks. Now, you have to understand that some people out there, in fact, a lot of people out there, just don't value photography at all. That's not something. One of my friend's daughters is a young mom, one child, and we've had this conversation many times about she, for the life, of her can't understand why I'm a photographer or why people would come to a photographer and spend money. I, and no amount of discussion with her or anything has been able to change her mind. She can't see it. Why would I pay? Why would I part with my money for something I can do myself? I could sit the family down on the sofa and snap a cell phone picture and she'd be perfectly happy. So you know what? Don't waste your breath. You're not going to win over 100% of the people. Don't get frustrated about it. Just if you have bad luck and happen to hit 100 of those people in a row and you start to say to yourself, well, this is a losing game, forget that. You can't think that way. Ignore those people. Don't try and educate them. I hear all the time photographers saying we have to educate our clients. Screw it. You can't, you're not going to win that game. Don't argue with them. Ignore them. Don't put on a dog and pony show. They're not going to buy anyways. So I say that there's a name for these people, and that is not a client, not even a potential client. Don't build a herd of clients that won't buy. So we're going to ignore all of those people. Have a nice life. Adios. So if you're a PSH Gold member, go to the media library. Check out a video presentation on Don't Get Clients. That's a short form for the whole title. <clears throat> so as I said, it's hard to move up from the bottom. So McDonald's is known for low-priced economy foods. What if you went to McDonald's tomorrow and they said a hamburger is $27? They're not going to make themselves. They're not going to turn around. They're not going to suddenly become a boutique hamburger place. They'll go broke. So once you position yourself or brand yourself as a low-price photographer, you're stuck there. It's harder than hell to get out of it. So you're, you've just doomed yourself to failure. Don't go there. Now, to be a good photographer, and to get those little red people at the bottom of our sales funnel, we have to go through a lot of people and we don't want to we don't want to get discouraged along the way there's going to be a lot of people as i've said a couple of times now that just aren't going to buy from us so we want the people who will buy from us but the people who will buy from us want to see good work so you have to be worth if you're going to ask for top dollar which is what i just said you have to be worth top dollar. You have to believe it, show it, live it, breathe it, and deliver it. So that's the biggest thing. Is your work worthwhile? That's what I said. Go check it out in a couple of slides ago. Um, then, if our work is good, and we're proceeding with this, we have to filter out all those blue people because they're not going to buy. And believe me, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. In fact, if I had to put numbers on it, I guess something in the order of 95% won't buy. Substantially. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about getting an order for $45. That's nothing. $45, you know, doesn't even fill up my car. Um so I'm talking about people who will come in from a family portrait session and spend <clears throat> Excuse me, fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred, two thousand dollars, um, and more sometimes. 
So we have to attract the right people, recruit the right people. So I almost think of it as clients are interviewing for the permission to be a customer. Now that sounds a little bit arrogant. We don't actually say that to them, but think about that process. You're, you're going to attract a lot of people, but you're only going to keep a few of them. So get good or get gone. Is your work stunning? Do you live up to expectations every day? Are you reliable? In other words, uh, this week you produced some really, really good work, but last week was all crap. If you're not reliable, if people don't know that they can rely on you to deliver top-notch work every time, not some of the times, then you've got a problem. Do you deliver customer service in line with high-end expectations? Do you want to be a high-end photographer? It's got to carry through the whole game. Um, you just can't. And I've seen this time after time after time. Photographers who are artistic geniuses and then totally lose it on customer service. They shoot a wedding and then it's four to five months before the customer sees their work. That's no good. Doesn't mean that you have to, you know, leave the wedding, come home and um, do the work in a couple of hours and deliver it to them the next day. I don't mean that either. You need a reasonable time to get things ready. That's fine. I'd be reliable. I, um, under promise and over deliver. So I'll tell them it's going to take three, four, five weeks before your pictures are ready for viewing. And they find you, they've been told, they accept it, they go off on their honeymoon. And then when I call them in three weeks to say your pictures are ready, uh, they're excited. If you do it the opposite way around, you know the problem that you have, you're going to lose a customer. But do you show well? That's the other whole thing. If you're going to be high end, you got to kind of play the game. Does your studio have curb appeal? Do you dress nicely? I know many studios, even though it's a small staff, they go out and get T-shirts made. Nice polo, expensive polo shirts with the studio name on it. They look professional. I know another photographer uh, was a pretty good photographer, lived in a not so good neighborhood. The house kind of looked like shambles. He had told me several times that he was expecting a customer. He'd watch through the window. He'd see them come up to his house, stop, never get out of the car, never even turn off the engine. And a few minutes later, they just drive away. He didn't have curb appeal. Um, do you have samples on display? Are they to die for? Do you run your business like a professional business? Or do you look and present yourself like a fly-by-nighter? You've got to analyze these things. Run a professional business, do things properly, and dress for it, decorate for it. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have a beautiful studio in a bad neighborhood. I know of several photographers who've done that, particularly in large cities. Maybe the neighborhood isn't so good, but once they walk in the studio, wow, everything's forgotten the minute they walk through the door. So um, if you're not ready on all of these points, don't launch your business. Hold. Get ready, make your work excellent, and when you've pulled all your act together, then start going down the road. So, okay, we've set the stage. You're all good. Now what do you do? How do we get this first 100 clients? i got to say this. Um, I'm not saying Wolf of Wall Street was my favorite movie, but I love this little section where the lead character, Jordan Belfort, is addressing a room full of his sales executives and giving a very motivational speech. And these lines just stuck in my mind because um, it's so much in tune of what I believe and what I try and do. So he goes on to say, listen to me and listen well. 
Are you behind on your credit card bills? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Is your landlord ready to evict you? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Does your girlfriend think you're a worthless loser? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. And isn't that the truth? Sure, all of us have had financial stress from time to time, unexpected expenses, health issues, all sorts of things happen in life. You can get really stressed out on them. You got credit card companies calling, not a good thing. Drives you nuts. Financial woes are some of the worst going. So just take action. Now, this movie took place in the 80s. So they called people. You don't use the phone that much anymore. We do, but not like they're this, these lines are suggesting. So what do we do? Talk to people. The thing that creates success is the thing we almost never want to do. Simply talk to people. Sometimes the old-fashioned way. Face-to-face -face whenever we can. And I don't care what anybody says. Face-to-face, -face, even me, the old, big, fat guy, um, bald, fat guy, will get more progress with the customer when I meet them face-to-face. -face. So it's not about personal appearance. It's about the fact that you make a connection to somebody when you meet them. Why do companies, to this day, in spite of all the technology we have and conference calling and everything else, why do they have their salespeople hop on a plane and fly halfway around the world to meet with the client instead of just having a conference call? Because it's valuable. It works. There's something unique about seeing being there live. If you're a fan of music and ever gone to a concert, you can buy the CD and download the music and it's all great and it's fun. But there's nothing like being at the concert, which is why to this day they fill stadiums full of people. So, yeah, face to face. Go to trade shows. Find excuses where you get to meet them face to face. So social media is what everybody's talking about today. And I'm on to I'm in tune. I'm good. Um, depending on what market you're going after, um, I think it's either Facebook or LinkedIn for our business. Now, people can talk about Instagram and Twitter and everything else, and there are, you know, minimal advantages to each and every one of them. But for the sake of this presentation, I want to talk about Facebook and LinkedIn because between the two of them, I think they're the ones that really matter for what I'm trying to accomplish. And there is a ton of potential in social marketing. If it's done right, you can also do it wrong and lose a ton of money. Facebook messaging and text messaging are pretty much standard. If you don't like it, get over it. Learn to like it because it you're not going to change the world. The world isn't going to listen to you and say, you're right, I should never text message or Facebook message again. It's the way business is done. No big deal. So steps to success. Let's get down to a nitty gritty plan. So number one, start branding right from the beginning. So I was starting primarily a boudoir business. I thought boudoir is kind of sexy. It's got some sizzle to it. At the time, the internet had just released the dot photography domain series, and I was able to grab sizzle dot photography. So I made that my brand. So my brand is also my website, sizzle.photography. You can go there now if you want. That's the address. Um, if you haven't already, start a Facebook business page. Highly critical to this program. It's not everything. It's just part of what you want to do. Don't say, okay, I've got my Facebook business page and I'm done. You haven't even started. Look for local trade shows and organizations you can join. Join the Chamber of Commerce. They, uh, Most of them have regular meetings, if not weekly, at least monthly. Show up at the meetings. Have face-to-face -face communication with people. Pay whatever they want to have a little display or setup or to talk to their audience. 
if there are women shows, bridal shows, if you're a wedding photographer, look for bridal shows, best thing ever. And if you're a photographer, <laughs> I hate to keep saying this, gold members can download the, uh, the presentation we have called How I Book 17 Weddings at a Single Bride Show, blah, blah, blah. Um, but women shows, lots of women shows out there. And let's face it, not just because of a boudoir studio. Women drive the economy. If the economy was left up to men, other than boats and motorcycles and guns and beer, nothing else would sell. Um, women drive the economy, end of statement. So find a women's show, get in there, meet them face to face, put on a wonderful display. Your website have a first-class responsive website. The, the term responsive when used with websites simply means that it's adaptable to any kind of display from small smartphones all the way up to big monitors. That's all responsive website means. Um, start a customer database. I use a product called Zoho CRM. It's free. It's excellent. It's easy to learn. And honestly, I have a paid account, but only because I'm with Photography Schoolhouse. If I was just a photographer, I could use their free product for the rest of time. It's amazingly complete. Um, so get that started. And every time you've got a client or a lead, it goes into your database. And it's online, so you don't have to be, even if you're traveling, or uh, running a studio in one building and a home in the other. It doesn't matter where you are. You can access your data from any location that has an internet connection, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, step six, identify local charitable organizations. And step seven, plan a free local lesson to give. Yeah, we're getting into details. Don't worry. Hang in there. So let's... Start about the Facebook page. It's, if you haven't, fill it, uh, take one out, start one with your business name, fill out all the details, and start posting images along with comments uh, and try and post it daily if you can. If you have enough work to do, sometimes you don't have enough samples in the beginning. Post as often as you possibly can. Some will even say a couple of times a day. Now, there's all sorts of strategies about sharing other posts to build traffic to your site. I don't do them. I don't want to distract from my message. I'm not an entertainment organization. I have a personal Facebook stuff where I put personal stuff. Nothing clutters my business page except my business. Um, so share these posts with women's groups in your area. You can look up groups in Facebook by geographical area. Find out what groups are already existing in your area. I did a search in my area for Facebook and for Facebook modeling groups, found several of them. So when I post, I share the post with every group I can. Get the message out, particularly when you have no likes in the beginning. Who's going to listen to you? Make a post. Nobody in the world is going to see it but you. So you've got to share the post into other groups to get it going. Um, and the modeling groups, here's the deal on modeling groups. It's awesome and it's terrible at the same time. Every community has a cross-section of young ladies who want to be a model, and they participate in these groups, and they'll shoot with photographers for free. They just like to get the images. Uh, because they can shoot for free, they'll expect that from every photographer i'm pretty you want to photograph me you need to give me free pictures um, and that's just the way it is so in the beginning if you're starting from scratch and you need more samples and you need more practice um, not a bad thing offer some shoots to these ladies get some samples get a model release of course and that gives you content to continually post um, and share just that you're not going to get a lot of money sometimes yes but it's pretty rare um, 
So even with these free models that I get, I share every post. I take my favorite images from that shoot and I share them with at least four groups, maybe more sometimes. And the whole idea, if they like it, people will start liking your page. Now, you can do other things to drive people to like your page, and we're going to take advantage of all of them. Um, but this is one of the ways I started getting my first few likes in my test business back in January of 2015. Now, I don't just let anybody like my page. No, nope. I have to be convinced that they're a good potential client. So every time I get a like or a group of likes, I go into Facebook and I check out who they are. I go to their Facebook page. And number one, if they're not in my geographical area, then I don't want to talk them. Somebody from Timbuktu likes my page. No, bye-bye. You can, you can set them to unlike them, to get them off your likes. Um, so I want only people that fall into my target market. I want my like. I'm not worried about numbers. You know, people want to build big numbers as a bragging point to their friends. Oh, I've got 1,000 likes. Oh, yeah, well, I've got 1,500 likes. It's not about that. Forget all that. Put that crap out of your mind. It's about building a herd of people, of potential customers, um, and You'll see why in the next couple of steps. So think small, but think quality. Whatever you do, do not, do not, do not buy likes from Facebook or anybody. It's the worst thing you can do to kill your page in a nutshell. In fact, I made that mistake early on, uh, not in relation to this business venture, but another one. Um, thought, okay, I'll just jumpstart my business. I'll give Facebook. I'm not going to use these third-party ones. I'm going to use Facebook. they got to be legit. I'll just give them some money and buy some likes. Worst thing ever. I had to kill that page and restart it all over again. So Facebook contests, one of the best things I ever did was hold a Facebook contest at least once a month. Don't overdo it. I hold one per month. Uh, I put up, because I'm really promoting boudoir photography in this particular business, I put up a prize of a free boudoir session. I uh, spend not more than $20 or $25 on boosting the post, and I boost it to people that like my page and friends of people that like my page. So here's why selecting the right likes is so important, or else you're just going to waste what little advertising we're spending. We're going to flush it down the toilet. So if I've got a like from Timbuktu, I'm spending money not just to advertise to Timbuktu, the guy in Timbuktu, but to all the friends of the guy in Timbuktu. Um, that's why it's so important to get rid of them. We want our likes to be genuinely reached by our sales message. <coughs> Excuse me. So only one's going to win, and they're going to be happy, and you're going to get great samples <coughs> and great PR out of it. It's free advertising. Well, not free. You're doing work for it. Um, but in the, the post, in the contest post, tell people to like your page to qualify for bonuses at the end of the contest. Now, in reality, I don't bother cross-referencing new likes on my page to who entered the contest. So what do I do? I employ a strategy that I used to use in the old days when I was at a, a live event. Everybody wins. Everybody wins something. Only person number one wins the big free boudoir session, but everybody's going to win something, a little something. And why is that important? Because when um, you go into Facebook and on average, and this is a small community, but I usually get 90 to 100 ladies or people will enter my contest. <clears throat> um, even though my contest is targeted at females, guys will enter it anyways. I don't get it. But each and every one of those people that enter is a potential. They were interested. They came to your page. They entered their con your contest. And 
that's awesome now at the end you say well congratulations so and so you won prize number one then i go into each and every person that entered and i send them a message to say that they won a consolation prize and i have a nice little image done up and i attach the image to the message and why do I do that? Why don't I send them a Facebook message? Why do I do it right on my page? Because I want to build Facebook engagement. So Facebook's going to read that engagement. But more importantly, the customer is going to read that engagement. Oh, look, Kerry just gave me one of these. Isn't he a nice guy? I've seen his page and I've seen his work. That's pretty good. So you're building this credibility that we were talking about a little while ago. Now, if you've had trouble building up your initial likes, and I did this a couple of times, it's a little bit more expensive, not quite as good as the first method I already described, but I do a targeted group. Uh, so obviously, number one, I geo-target. I select the specific area I want the ad to run in, and I select women age 18 to 55. Um, that's about all the targeting I do. And I'll, I'll spend some money, 20, you know, I, it's very rare. I think the biggest campaign I've ever done was $40. I don't do, um, you know, don't think that you have to throw a hundred bucks or 200 or 500. Uh, I don't think that's effective use of your money. Start with 20. If 20 doesn't do it, go to 25. Um, we want to keep this fairly sane. Now, I've heard people start to say, oh, you don't need a web page anymore because Facebook is so good, you can just do that. Well, I understand what they're saying because I've had a lot of luck with my Facebook page, but I would never give up on my website because I see them as two totally different roles. I think of Facebook as the bait and the website is the net to haul them in. My whole point of my Facebook page is to get them to my website where I have lots of samples, lots of stuff and um, lots of information. They could spend hours just going through everything and blog posts with valuable, but yet free information. Like we were saying before, we're positioning ourselves as the guru of this particular thing. Now, I'm using my boudoir stuff as an example here. I also have another site. I keep them separate, my Allen Studio site, which is where I do pretty much exactly the same strategy, uh, but for headshots. There's a lot of movie making going on in our community right now for a number of reasons, not the least of which the local provincial organization is throwing money at the a movie industry and uh, right now a low Canadian dollar is bringing in a lot of productions so all these people suddenly find that there's a job available but they need a headshot so have a headshot business um, so it's always the websites job to reel them in now create the website it's important that you do this right with sound SEO behind it. Now, don't I don't mean hire an SEO company. SEO companies, as much as they brag about what they're going to do for you, um, aren't going to do as much as you hope. Most people are disappointed with the money that they spend on SEO companies. Because really, the stuff that attracts people to your website is the stuff that only you can do. They don't know about your business, your abilities, or what you did last week. And if you're going to spend all the time writing to them with this information for them to post on your website, why don't you put it on your website yourself? Um, so there are some sound SEO rules, and this isn't an SEO presentation. Again, sorry, I hate to say this, but PSH Gold members, uh, you, we have SEO videos in the media library, several of them. They're excellent. Um, you want to learn about SEO, watch those videos. So blogging to success. I write a lot of detailed um, blog posts 
on subjects that are specifically of interest to women who are considering a boudoir and addressing their concerns. How many women are considering a boudoir? A hundred percent of them. So that's the, my latest one. A little shy about doing your boudoir session? Or how can I hide my problem areas in my boudoir photos? Or why do plus size women look so hot? And I'm, I make, you know, those are just summaries. Each one of those has a fairly substantial um, article written with it with sample images and good, valuable information. And it's free. And I put it on my website because it'll make Google happy. It's lots of words, and Google loves words. It doesn't love images. It only loves words. And um, I link it. I put paid ads on my Facebook page that link back to these articles. And that's been enormously successful. Probably the most successful one I ever did was the one in the middle. How can I hide my problem areas in my boudoir photos? It brought a ton of new likes to my page, on my Facebook page, and it drove dozens, hundreds of people to my website where they could see all my samples and blah, blah, blah. I track these results pretty carefully. I don't, I'm a numbers kind of guy. I like numbers. I like to know when things are working and I like to know when they're failing. And so I look at Facebook's analytics. I look at Google analytics. I'm pretty much almost day to day on top of exactly what's happening. So I can identify failures and successes quickly. I love trade shows. As I've said several times, there's nothing better than a trade show, meeting people eye to eye. So this happened to be a pretty small event. This picture is actually of our table. I took it with my cell phone, so that's why you see it from the, uh, from the inside out. But um, here's what we did. We only had one table. It wasn't a very sophisticated trade show, local community thing. We went down there with nothing but 12 by 18 images that we bought from Costco, cheap. Not eight by tens, don't save money, not five by sevens, 12 by 18. I think they're 4.99 or 3.99, something like that at Costco. If they get damaged, I don't care. For 3.99, I'll get them reprinted. We had stacks of them and people loved it. It was one of the best things ever. They come running right over to the table. They leaf through, they paw through the images and oh, and they, it, it's, it's great. I never would have thought it would be kind of as cool as it was. Uh, I don't have to have big samples framed and hung in behind me. I used to do that in my wedding booths years ago. If I wasn't doing a wedding show today, I, I wouldn't do that anymore. I'd do exactly what I did here. I've had a couple of sample albums, so I had those down too. And as always, we hold a draw for a free session. They have a ticket they have to fill out. They have to put their email and their phone number, and there's a checkbox. I hereby give permission. Um, I forget exactly how we worded it, but basically, you know, you can't send somebody an unsolicited email anymore. We do. Some people fly under the radar, and some people get away with it for a while, but technically it's against the law. So I'm a law kind of guy, so I put the checkbox, and they have to check it. Well, they don't have to. They can choose not to. Sorry, that was a bad way of saying it. Um, most of them check it. Some don't. So we know uh, who we can call and who we can email. Um, we select a winner, um, but we plan a follow-up campaign for all the rest. Now, I've done this kind of strategy with my trade shows for decades. This isn't anything new. Um, we always had a follow-up campaign. We always knew what we were going to do right away before the doors even opened to the trade show. We had a plan in place. Uh, we add the emails that we're allowed to to an email program. And by the way, again, under the premise that we want to keep things as cheap as we can, MailChimp is a free emailer program that, again, probably you would never ever need to upgrade to their paid version 
I do have a paid version again, but that's more because of Photography Schoolhouse. If it was just sizzle.photography, <clears throat> excuse me, I wouldn't ever have to take out a paid. I'd have free email program for life. So we're building our herd, our clientele. Sorry I use the word herd. It's not really derogatory if you're thinking that. Um, I got it from a marketing guru, and I've just kind of kept it ever since. So we're gathering leads and customer information, and yes, it's damn important. Didn't used to be. Many photographers existed for decades very successfully without doing this, and all of those photographers are gone. Yay for them, or yay for us, because now we get their business that they lost. Um, we use it to remember what we shot, when we shot it, who they are, who their names are, who the kids' names are, um, when certain dates are important, anniversaries or birthdays or anything like that. Uh, we send them quarterly newsletter of, with just general purpose studio news. Plus, we send them, we, we set a reminder to follow up when we need to contact them next. Oh, they've got an anniversary next month. We should call them right now and set up an appointment. Um, it it helps us be proactive about our business rather than waiting, hoping for the phone to ring. Now, a free product, Zoho CRM, as I mentioned before. It's free online. CRM, by the way, is just customer relationship management. That's all CRM means just means that it's a customer database. Um, it's awesome. It's free. And you'll never have to upgrade to Pro that I could ever see. So the next thing we want to look at is charitable promotions. And this is important for what? Yes, it's nice to give back to your community. It goes without saying. But what is our benefit? Our benefit is we're trying to move our clientele. We're trying to move our herd from the low price to the high price. And when it comes to charities, who's more likely to be a contributor or a donator? People with money to spend. If you don't have any money, it's pretty hard to give it away. So what we're trying to do is continue our goal of reaching and building our clientele to a higher level. People that can afford to pay our prices without having to discount them. So we find out, contact local charities, find out when they're having fundraisers. They always have fundraisers. And quite often they'll auction off companies' products and services. So they're anxious to talk to you. Say, hey, you know, I'm a photographer and I'd like to give a free session and a free 16 by 20. And you can auction it off. I'll give it to you for free. You auction it off for as much money as you can get. And uh, if they have an event that I can attend, I want to be there. I don't want to just get a phone call from the winner the next day. I want to be there. I want the exposure. I want to see them eyeball to eyeball. Everybody, even the people that didn't win. Um, so get all the free advertising we can because it's advertising to exactly the right people. Local theater companies. Local symphony orchestra if you're in a large enough center. All of these things are the type of clientele that we want to talk to. So we're moving our herd from low paying to high paying customers. Working events. Um, Christmas time, quite often companies, organizations have Christmas parties. I have a personal photographer friend who has very successfully for many years now been the event photographer for the local doctors association. They have an annual party in December. He's there. He sets up. He does pictures. In this case, they do five by sevens that the organization gives for free. <coughs> Pardon me. And... Uh, has done that. He does it different every year. So people don't get the same picture they had last year. Every year they get something different, different backgrounds, different lighting. He's very good at keeping it up to date. And he has, over the years, 
gotten mountains of business out of this. He's not worried about what he's going to earn, a few shekels he's going to earn for distributing five by sevens. He should be paying them. He's getting the right to meet dozens or even a hundred or more ideal target customers. Normally you'd have to pay for that, and they're paying him. Um, so, yeah, doctors generally have more disposable income are more likely to spend money, serious money, on a really good product. So find out who these organizations are. Now, if it's the local um, iron workers, I guess any union would probably be good. But, you know, you want to target who, who are my customers. Um, now... I, for this kind of marketing, this kind of event marketing, I wouldn't target charities unless they're having some sort of a gala. Um, but if you can be the event photographer for the policeman's ball or the fireman's ball or whatever is out there, jump on it. Make it happen. Don't rely, don't wait for your phone to ring. Contact them. Make it happen. So it's not about the cash you're going to earn at the event. I've heard so many photographers, and I thought this myself. Geez, I went and I did all that work, and all I made was 150 bucks. It's not worth it. That wasn't the point. The cash is simply the bonus money to buy the beer when you're tired. Um, it's about making the contacts. So if you just show up, take the picture, shove it in their hand, and do nothing, okay, you lost. But if you can communicate, you can talk to them and establish that credibility by showing samples of your work, then that's exactly what you want to get done. Hold a free community course. If you have a studio or a studio in your home um, with a nice showroom, nice beautiful sample pictures in it, hold a free seminar in your studio showroom. Now, a photographer who you probably all know, who shoots babies, whose name I'm not going to mention, um, did an amazing thing. And I, I slapped my head when I figured out what she was up to. She said, and she's well established. She doesn't need all that much to advertise. Everybody knows this photographer all around North America. Um, so she held a free course in her studio, how to take awesome baby pictures. I added with your cell phone, um, but she just said how to take awesome baby pictures for free. And people would come to her studio and to attend her course. And as she's telling them how, demonstrating how to take awesome baby pictures with a point and shoot or a cell phone or whatever, they're looking around at her awesome pictures hanging on the wall and saying, oh, my God, I can't believe how beautiful this stuff is. So how much do you think her free seminar made her? Mountains. So do the same thing if you do families, boudoir, whatever. Just the only deal is make sure that you've got good, gorgeous pictures to show them or else this whole thing will backfire on you. If you don't have a great display area, find a free meeting room. Sometimes churches or community centers will make meeting rooms free or at least very affordable. Drive people at all of these events to like your page. We want to get them into our system. So getting people to like our page, the, now the deal is we want to engage them, which means we have to make a reason to talk to them on our page. So you've got to think this up all the time. I said at, at the contest that we could simply offer a consolation prize. That was a good way of engaging in a conversation. But I always... Try to come up with a way of taking a conversation like that and ending it with a question that encourages them to respond. And, of course, they're going to respond on your page. So Facebook says, hmm, 
they're engaging, and that's important. They measure this engagement. It's a thing called page rank. Um, but again, it's not so much about Facebook in this case. It's about establishing a dialogue with a client so that you can become the expert, become the guru and the friend, so that when they are ready to buy, you're the person they come to. That's what we're really trying to accomplish. Even if the Facebook engagement amounted to nothing, we don't care because that's not really what we're after. So I also make it proactive. I came up years ago, many, many years ago, actually, with what I call a pumper program, sales pumper program. Uh, so we have a PSH, Photography Schoolhouse Sales Pumper Program. It's a method. Uh, to help keep me on track. When I decide it's a two-month program, it's an eight-week program that I do, you're just seeing my actual worksheets from one of my campaigns. So I have a form that I made. I use it. I measure it. So in this particular case, um, you see the numbers that um, on Monday of the very first week, it says 25 mailings. And that doesn't mean snail mail by the way. I, that's just what I called it because it's a leftover term. When I started this, it was snail mail. Now, to me, it can be email or any kind of communication. In other words, get in touch with the customer. Um, so I get in touch 25 on Monday, 25 on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I take Friday off. So I'm getting 100 outbound messages the first week. And then the second week and the third and the fourth and so on. And I measure the responses. So Monday, the first Monday, I got 12 uh, in total. Then it was up to 23 on Tuesday. It was up to 36 on Wednesday and so on and so on. Um, as you can see, as we got down to the end of the page, 466. Not bad. Now, things happen. You get busy, you have to skip a day. So that's why we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You can see sometimes I wrote in those numbers because if I skip the day, those are my makeup days. So, and this goes on for two months and the whole game plan is to contact 500 people five times. And I might leave that after that's over because it's, <laughs> It's not too bad in the beginning, but once you start getting into week three, four, and five, <laughs> it's some work. Um, so I might leave it for a few months, and then when I'm refreshed, I'll do it again, and I'll do it again, and I'll do it again, and I'll continue doing it again as long as I'm in business. Having a regimented program and a reminder of when to get things done and how many things to get done it's not such a bad idea. So start your own pumper program. Start your own eight-week sales pumper program. Develop a routine daily schedule to contact new potential clients for eight weeks. This is above and beyond any social marketing that you're already doing. So remember the part about if you're able to stick with things way back in the beginning, you're starting to see what I mean because this starts to get to be a real full-time job. And um, if you've got big obligations to family or anything else, your time is going to be really stretched. So remember the danger of social marketing is it tends to bring in the wrong clients. So with this program, we're going to approach the right people, the right clients, and for whatever we want, set a goal. We want to get 50 new potential clients or 25 or 10 or one, whatever. I like 50. I like 100 even better. Um, just in the next eight weeks. That's it. Call it your sales pumper program. Start from your home. And yes, I didn't mention it, but there is a sales pumper program in the gold member section for you to use. Uh, keep expenses ultra low. Don't take out commercial space. Mentioned this before. Don't commit to expenses. Start from your home. I did it in my apartment. I started this new business in a two bedroom apartment. My living room was my studio. And I had to innovate 
to make it work because there wasn't a lot of room. There was furniture I had to work around. So I used auto poles with boom arms to hold the lights instead of using light stands, smaller footprint. Um, hardwood floors meant uh, it was easy to move furniture around. We had a set of large patio doors facing the right way, let in beautiful light during the day. And so I would have available light for daytime and studio light for other times. And yeah, sorry, gold members only. Um, go to the pro lighting in the home studio, it's a series of 10 videos shot in the very space we're talking about on different subjects, just to show what can be done um, in a small apartment living room. They're all in the media library. So if it's easy, everybody would do it. Business today is not easy in any business, photography or ice skating or any business. It's just not easy. Um, you have to be financially sound to carry yourself for the first couple of years. If you're not, rethink. If you don't have the quality of product to compete at the highest level, rethink. If you're not an entrepreneur by nature, rethink. If you don't have the passion for photography, rethink. So there is a program, if you want, that we sell. Um, starts July, the um, first Tuesday in July, I believe it is, or first Monday in July. I can't think of the date right now. It's the get your first 100 or next 100 sales bumper program it's an eight week program there are three live how-to webinars eight weekly live coaching sessions three personal one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions one year of total access to all materials and recordings downloadable marketing materials you can edit yourself progress mile markers winning seo strategies for photographers social marketing pressure cooker and um, free premium photography website, which is from our sponsor, Global Star website. So they threw this in to the package. It's not really free, I guess, because you pay for the package. Um, but that's a $198 value, but it's included with all of this. Uh, regularly, we charge $399 for this. We're giving it away $100 off early bird, we call it, up until June the 15th. But if you buy tonight, you get it with the uh, free website. Honestly, really, if you buy by June the 15th, you'll still get the website. So join today and save 100 bucks, And um, that's what I came to tell you. You've heard about PSH Gold Membership. If you're not a Gold Member, you want access to all of the goodies that Gold Membership brings, you can do that for as little as $19.95 a month. Just go to www.pshgold.com. And back on the other, I forgot to mention, to get this pumper program of getting your first 100 customers, um, pshnow.com. You want the details? www.pshnow.com. If you just want gold membership information, pshgold.com. We make it easy for you. So I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. I'll wait for a second. Rent a little long tonight, sorry. My goal was an hour. I went an hour and 23 minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you all for attending. I hope you found this useful, enjoyable, and um, we'll see you next time. Have a good night.